Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker. Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on Is There a Devil or Satan? I know it's this is like a very, very basic doctrine, but there are groups of people that'll tell you, oh, well, there's really no devil. There's no Satan. Uh, it's just a metaphor. What is a metaphor? Well, it's just a phrase that you have that... Well, let's see. Metaphor is a noun. It means to transfer over or to carry a short similitude. Um, when you look at a beautiful woman and, well, you hear a guy talking about a beautiful woman and goes, wow, look at her. She's a fox. You know, that's a metaphor. Or... Um, that businessman, he's sly as a fox, you know, crafty and cunning. Or when you say those soldiers, they fought like lions. Well, that's a metaphor. So when you get to Genesis chapter 3 and it says, you know, the serpent uh, with Eve, well, you know, oh, well, that's just a metaphor, you know, they'll people that believe that stuff will tell you well you know really there wasn't a talking snake it was just you know eve is just you know mankind is just inherently evil and i don't know but uh there's a group in what they call christian identity and what that is basically is a group of people that believe that christians are the lost tribes of Israel, which wouldn't surprise me. But sometimes I wonder if the devils plant people like this in the camp to come up with stuff like this. Oh, there's no devil. There's no Satan. Just so that when you're talking to people like, oh, I don't know, Baptists or whatever, and you talk to them and then they're like oh yeah well that guy he doesn't even believe in a devil so everything else that he teaches is wrong too you know I, that's what I that's kind of how I look at it but the Baptists don't look at the uh, fact that they believe that the Antichrist or God's chosen people or you know dispensational theology or the pre-trib rapture being wrong no, they don't look at that. You know, they just look at one, you know, the one glaring wrong thing and then just discount and ignore everything else. So I tend to wonder, do, do these false things get planted in these groups or movements just to lead people away from what possibly might be the truth i don't i don't know all right so let's uh let's take a look at a couple things what is satan well webster's 1828 dictionary of which i have a lot of respect for the man was a linguist which is a language scholar he knew over 20 different languages including Biblical Hebrew and Biblical Greek, Old Testament Hebrew and New Testament Greek, in addition to English and Latin and a whole bunch of things. I mean, the guy could go to Europe, almost any country in Europe, and communicate with people in two or three different languages. Uh, here in the United States, most of us English natives, we barely know one language. Well, we know barely know one language for the most part. 
Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, identify as Hispanics. Uh, they usually know two languages. I had a friend, he was from Puerto Rico, um, and uh, we used to joke that he was illiterate in two languages. He could speak both languages, Spanish and, and English, but to write them, he didn't, he couldn't do it, uh, which is kind of a shame, you know, it's, it's a shame not being able to read and write a language that you can speak. So he could carry on a conversation in two languages, but yeah, we used to joke with him that he was illiterate in two languages, but uh, you know, we weren't cutting him down or anything, but you know, uh, sometimes I'd get some something and say, hey, can you translate this into Spanish for me? And he couldn't do it. So he'd get his mom to do it, you know, so whatever. But we had a lot of fun. But uh, so Satan is a noun. In Hebrew, it means an adversary. Do you know that there was a time when the Lord says that he was Israel's adversary? There was actually a time that God became Satan to Israel. Well, by that definition. But it says Hebrew, an adversary, the grand adversary of man, the devil or prince of darkness, the chief of the fallen angels. And we're going to cover that uh, when God became Israel's adversary. All right. And then you got devil. Uh, take a capital D and then follow it with the word evil. You could say devil. It's also a noun. In Christian theology, an evil spirit or being a fallen angel expelled from heaven for a rebellion against God, the chief of the apostate angels, the implacable enemy and tempter of the human race. In the New Testament, the word is frequently and erroneously used for demon. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe uh, demons are the spirits of the giants that were drowned in Noah's flood. That's what I think they are. I'm not 100% sure because the Bible doesn't specifically tell you that's what they are, but that comes from other sources. However, we know they exist. So, possibly. You know, there's a lot of things the Bible doesn't talk about. Um, you know, the Bible's the book of Adam and Christ, the Redeemer. You know, Satan is mentioned, but the book isn't about him. Uh, all right, devil. Second definition is a very wicked person used in ludicrous language. You ever heard that? You know, that man's a devil. Uh, a great evil in profane language. It is an expletive expressing wonder, vexation, etc. An idol or false god. Leviticus 17, 7 and 2 Chronicles 11, 15. That's what I love about Webster's Dictionary. The guy was a believer and a scholar. And when you look up his definitions, he'll use um, Bible verses to explain things. One day when the Internet's uh, gone, if it ever is, I don't know, maybe if they pull a fake EMP or whatever, electromagnetic pulse and knocks out all the electric for a period of time, uh, it would be very beneficial to have a hard copy of a dictionary. All right, so we know what a metaphor is. We know what devil means and Satan. So let's get going here. Uh, you'll probably hear one day that uh, there are people that teach that uh, God is uh, both good and evil, which uh, 
I would run away from those kind of people. But there are there were times that God was an adversary to Israel. And that word adversary is sometimes translated as uh, Satan, if memory serves me correctly. Yeah. So that doesn't mean God is Satan, although there are people that will try to convince you uh, that's true. All right. So let's take a look at some uh, things in the Bible. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. Uh, through one through, verses 1 through 30 records the Lord's creation of the earth. Verse 31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, some people say that there was a creation before the creation uh, I don't know I'm I don't know I mean there's some evidence both ways that there was a creation before the creation it says that the earth had become void without form without form and void I don't know it's you know but here it says it's a sixth day, and the Lord looked at everything he made, and it was very good. So, if there was a fallen creation before, it wouldn't have been any good. I, I don't know. That's how I look at it. But uh, then again, I'm not the final authority, and if you think otherwise, it's not that big of a deal. My main concern is to try to help people warn them against the devil and his wiles that wily coyote wily coyote yeah you know road runner beep beep yeah but instead of a road runner we got the devil all right so six day everything was very good and behold it was very good so, I think uh, all the angels up to this point were fine and dandy, no problem. Now, when you get to uh, Genesis 3, now I think sometime between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3 is when the rebellion in heaven happened. But that's just my theory. You know, that's what I believe. And if you believe something a little different, that's fine. You know, I'm not the final authority. The Bible's the final authority. but uh, And it's not a salvation issue. Some people say that Satan's not cast out of heaven until uh, sometime during the tribulation period because of revelation. A lot of revelation is future. A lot of it was past. And some of it was uh the present time when John was writing it. So, you know, what can I tell you? So, here it is. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Uh, why would people try to convince us that there is no devil, no Satan? Well, if there's no devil and no Satan, uh, no fallen angels, um, then that little thing with the giants in Genesis 6 couldn't have happened, right? They were just giants to do evil. They weren't super tall people that were, you know, 12 foot tall or whatever, you know? And if there's no devil, well... Why is there so much evil in the world? Why? You know, I, you know, when I hear stuff like this, it makes me think, these people, they got to be satanic plants. They really do. How do these people get so popular? I'm not going to mention this Christian identity minister's name. He's dead now. But where do they come up with this stuff? I don't know. Verse 2. 
And the woman said unto the serpent, well, evidently Eve's talking to herself because there's no such thing as a talking snake, right? And there's no devil and there's no Satan, right? That's what they teach you or they want us to believe. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what's the first thing out of the serpent's mouth? He questions God's word and lies. Oh, you guys, you know, you're not going to die. Don't worry about it. God's lying to you. No problem. He's trying to hold you down, keep you, hold you back. You, you want to be a God like me? Eat of the tree. No problem. And, of course, we know the rest of the story, right? Eve fell. So, no devil, right? It's just a metaphor. Eve was talking to herself or... You know, God, they want us to believe that God created us with good and evil. And the tree is just, well, are you going to pick to be good or are you going to pick to be evil? That's what they want you to believe. I absolutely do not believe that. I believe that they were, Adam and Eve were created good. And then uh, they chose to uh, follow evil. So who is this serpent? Well, how about Revelation chapter 12? And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And if you don't know what this is, look up Joseph's dream, okay, when he had a dream about the sun and the moon and the 11 sheaths that bowed down to him. Yeah, um... I did a Bible study on Revelation chapter 12 revealed, you know, the top right hand side of my channel has a magnifying glass kind of thing. Just type in Revelation 12 and it'll pop up. So, verse 2, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns upon his heads. Now, when people tell you, well, I, I, um, I interpret the Bible literally. Oh, no, no, that's wrong. I interpret the Bible metaphorically, you know, or spiritually. Well, they're both wrong. Sometimes the Bible's literal, and then other times it's, you know, a metaphor. Is there a red dragon? I think that's a metaphor. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. And did cast them to the earth. What are these stars? Well, when you read Job 38, the stars of heaven, the sons of God, uh, it's talking metaphorically about angels. All right. I mean, let's face it. When Stephen was getting ready to be stoned, his face shone like the sun. When Christ was transfigured on the mountain with Elijah and Moses, his face and his body and his clothing shone like the sun. They were bright like the sun. You know, these angels, the angels are called, uh, Satan's called a, an angel of light because of his brightness. I mean, you know, sometimes the Bible's metaphor, sometimes it's literal. It's both. Sometimes the Bible's past, sometimes the Bible's uh, future. 
you know, sometimes it's past and present and uh, future in the time of the apostle when he was living, when he was writing it down. Sometimes it was in the same chapter, part future, part past, and part present when he was writing it down. And, you know, it's, that's just the way it is. So when people say, oh, it's all past or it's all future, well, they're both wrong. And his trail, okay, Revelation 12, 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now, if these were actual literal stars, wouldn't the, wouldn't the earth burn up? No, they're angels. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And who is that? That's Christ. I hope you know that. And the woman, this is the church. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Here you go. Is there a devil? Is there Satan? And there was, past tense, and there was war in heaven. Oh, but Chaplain Bob, there is no devil. There is no Satan. It doesn't exist. So the war must, you know, it's only figuratively. How do you have a figuratively war, people? You don't. You know, this is when the Bible is literal. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Boom. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That's a figure of speech, people. The dragon, a figure in speech. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Why is it an old serpent? Because that serpent been around for a long time since the Garden of Eden. And the old dra that gr and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him remember he, the third part of the stars his dra tail drew you know you got to let the bible interpret the bible and I don't know where these people come up with this no devil theory. I, it's just, you know, if I heard somebody say that, I, I would run away. Just run away. I don't care what other truth. I mean, this is basic. This is, this is children's Bible study. I mean, really. And they sell books teaching people this garbage that, you know, there is no devil, there is no Satan. It's just a metaphor for our dual nature, you know. We're part good and we're part bad, you know, yin and yang, uh, you know. It's like a coin. You got heads and you got tails. Um, believe it or not, one time I flipped a coin and it landed on its side. <laughs> it only happened one time in my entire life, I, I think I was in junior high school and we were, uh, I don't know what we were doing exactly. Maybe it was for sports to see which team would start first, you know. But uh, seriously, it landed on its side. So, uh, you know, they say there's two sides to every story. Sometimes there's uh, lies, the truth and the real thing. I don't know. All right, let's read verse 10. So the great dragon was the dra cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. 
for the accuser, that's what Satan means, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. I wish pre-tribbers would read this verse. Well, God would never do that to us, make us die for our faith. Yeah, oh, we're the end time church. God loves us. God's not a wife beater. No, God isn't a wife beater. But the devil is. You better believe the devil is a wife beater. All right, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil, for the devil, for the devil that doesn't exist except for in the minds of uh, Bible scholars that are heretics. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Uh, how in the world do they come up with this no-devil theory? I, you know, they count on you not doing any due diligence. You know, oh, don't read the Bible. It's too hard to understand. You know, just listen to the preacher and make sure you throw that money in the collection plate. Make sure you tithe. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what they teach, the tithe. Make sure you tithe. You don't want to rob God. Praise a Jesus. Ugh, those people make me sick. It's amazing. All the laws of God were nailed to the cross except for the tithe. Boy, they make a major doctrine out of tithing. Why? If you don't tithe, uh, how, who's going to pay for my Cadillac? And no, I don't have a Cadillac. I got a Nissan. So, yeah. Who's going to pay for my Mercedes Benz? I always wanted a Mercedes Benz, but uh, that was back when I was, you know. And I don't want a Mercedes Benz now. I could think of better things to do with money than a Mercedes. You want to see salvation in the Old Testament? You know, you hear people say, oh, well, there's no... There's no salvation and grace in the Old Testament. It's all law, 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 and, and punishment, punishment, punishment. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, there's grace in Genesis 6 with Noah. It said Noah was a just man. Oh, let me, let me look it up. I hate paraphrasing because I don't want people accusing me of lying. All right, uh, Genesis 6 and verse 6. Chapter 6 and verse 6. Genesis 6, 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And uh, just a little side note here. I wonder if the uh, fallen angels were doing genetic experiments on things back then. I wonder. I mean, let's face it. An angel's accumulation of knowledge pales anything that we have. So, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Chaplain Bob, there's no grace in the Old Testament. Oh, really? Well, I found it right here in Genesis, in the first, within the first six chapters. 
but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. How's that for a testimony, people? Yes, there's grace in the Old Testament. You want to see salvation in the Old Testament? How about Zechariah chapter 3? All right, Zechariah, Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H. -H. Uh, there's Zechariah, and then there's Zephaniah, Z-E-P. Uh, but we're looking at Zechariah, Z-E-C. Um, Zebra, Echo, Charlie, Harry, Alpha, Romeo, uh, India, Alpha, Harry, uh, phonetics or whatever, spelling there. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Uh, and oh, by the way, um, when people say Yeshua, really what they're saying is Joshua. I just love the way the uh, you-know-whos mispronounce words to try to lead us sheep off in the wrong direction. But uh, they don't fool me very often anymore. They did for a while, but not anymore. I'm not saying uh, they never can fool me, but it's a lot harder now than it was back then. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So here it is. Joshua, the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan's at his right hand trying to resist him. And if you want an interesting Bible study, uh, sometimes the angel of the Lord speaks in the first person for the Lord himself and uses the word I. And, you know, so uh, there is a really decent study on the angel of the Lord, which I believe, and many Bible scholars believe, that it is the pre incarnated. Uh, Christ, Christ before he had a, bo a human body. Because an angel could never speak in the first person for God, the Lord himself. That would be improper. Satan might do it, but uh, not an angel of the Lord. You know, well, an angel that belonged to the Lord. Um, and I'm not saying this instance of the angel of the Lord is pre-incarnated Christ, although it could be. It could very well be. Uh, if you want an instance of that, it's in uh, Genesis 22, um, verse 15 and 16, about the angel of the Lord. It says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Oh, this is when uh, the Lord was had asked uh, Abraham to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. But here it is. An angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. So this can't be any mere angel. He says, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. So I believe this is a, a pre-incarnated Christ before he had a human body, before he was born in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 so, but I'm not saying 
of Zechariah 3, this is Christ. I'm not saying that. It could be, but it might not be. Zechariah 3, 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Now, that's a pretty interesting thing. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of a fire? Uh, do you know what a brand is? What did they do? Uh, you ever watch an old western? And they had cattle. And they would take a branding iron and stick it in the fire, get it red hot. And then they would uh, put it on the, you know, put a brand on the, the cattle. Uh, what else do they use brands for in fires? Well, those of you that have fireplaces, you know, you, you know, it's a, a, a poker, right? Move the, the logs around and what have you, you know, push a log into the fire or whatever. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And Joshua, Joshua's being compared to a brand that's in the fire, being plucked out of the fire. What fire? The flames of hell. Oh, and there's people that don't believe in hell either. Yeah, that's another bunch of heretics. Jesus talked about hell a lot. Oh, Chaplain Bob, they're just talking about the, the garbage dump at Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, that should scare you even more because he was comparing hell to the burning, uh, the burning garbage dump where the flames never quit burning. That should, that should open your eyes up even more. Uh, where do they come up with this stuff? Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Verse 3. And Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Dirty clothes or dirty flesh? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity. What's iniquity? Sin. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. See, there's salvation in the Old Testament. People don't get it. How many people you know that have read Zechariah? You know, I, I, I used to talk to people and they'd say, oh, well, I'm a Christian. And I would say, hey, can you name 10 books in the Bible? You know, most of them can't. Most people I've talked to, they can't even, they can't even name 10 books in the Bible. I can name 10 books in either the Old or New Testament without even breaking a sweat. And if you can't even name 10 books in the Bible, you've never read them. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. What's raiment? Clothing. Now remember, he's got filthy garments on. And we're going to go into, we're going to look at that change of garments, raiment, change of raiment, filthy garments. We're going to look at that in a minute. Verse 5. And I said, let them, fear, uh, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. A mitre was a, it's a type of, uh, 
it was a type of special hat that the uh, priest would wear. Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And I believe the branch has reference to uh, Christ. Verse 9. For behold, the stone, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Day of the Lord. When the Lord comes back, the iniquity of the land is going to be gone. All the evil ones burned. And God will uh, give everybody a, that's his a change of garments. Yeah. Verse 10. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Uh, didn't Jesus, uh, the vine was to be Israel and the fig tree was to be Judah. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go to Revelation 6. And verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, so this is the tribulation period. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Oh, that's another heresy. People will try to tell you, oh, well, when you die, you don't know nothing. You're just laying in the grave until God resurrects you. Your soul and your spirit, it's like you're asleep. You don't know nothing. But uh, is that what the Bible teaches? I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Who's crying? The souls under the altar. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So they're saying, hey, we want judgment. These people, uh, the people of the earth killed us. You know? I wanted to spend time with my family and take care of my children, and they murdered me. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Verse 11. Remember, uh, the, the guy had the filthy garments and would given, was going to be given a change of raiment? Well, here you go. Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. White robes. So they went from filthy garments to white robes. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Uh, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. 
See, the resurrection can't happen until the last person in Christ dies. It can't happen. It doesn't, the pre trib rapture doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's just a feel good doctrine. Oh, you won't have to suffer. All those millions of people that died in Eastern Europe under communism for their faith, ah, they were second class Christians. They're not, you know, we're the Western church. We're better than they are. Yeah, right. God would never let us suffer persecution for our faith. Oh, no. Oh, no. Never, never, never. Yeah. Until the last person in Christ dies, there will be no resurrection. These people are under the souls waiting for judgment. They're not in heaven having the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're having to wait until, it says, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. The pre-tribbers think they're up there having uh, dinner, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there's people down here on earth getting killed for their faith. What, did they, they're going to miss the they're going to miss the marriage supper of the Lamb? These people are dying for their faith. And pre-tribbers think, oh, well, they're going to miss the marriage supper of the Lamb because they didn't believe in the pre-trib rapture, so they're not going to be taken up. Yeah. Where's that in the Bible? Yeah, that's in the Gospel of Judas, chapter 66 and verse 6. Yeah. Judas, Judas 666. All right. Let's take a look at uh, Revelation 7. Verse 11. 711. Revelation 711. And then all the angels stood about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. We just had a chaplain. Uh, uh, no relation to me, uh, chaplain in the, um, I think it was the F Washington, D.C., the federal government, opened the prayer and said, Amen, a woman. Well, Amen doesn't have reference to male, no. And he said, Amen, and a woman or women. Uh, and I also prayed to some kind of Hindu deity, a Hindu god. I don't know. I mean, things are getting out of hand, if you ask me. But it's not even starting. Verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen, not a woman. Verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Ah, so you got people standing around in white robes. So what are these? Who, who are these people with these white robes? And where did they come from? Verse 14. Well, that's the Bob translation. Verse 14, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, what are you asking me for? You know the answer. And he said, and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, yeah. Change of filthy garments. A change of raiment. All right, in Matthew 4, all right, Jesus had uh, been baptized by John the Baptist in the river, Jordan. And then we get to Matthew 4. This is the beginning of uh, Jesus' uh, ministry. 
Matthew 4, 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Oh, but Chaplain Bob, the devil doesn't exist. It's just a metaphor. It's just a figure of speech. Really? Really? Verse 2. And when he, Jesus, had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Oh, okay. Well, if there's no devil, I guess Jesus is just talking to himself, right? I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that uh, some of these famous preachers teach. I, you know, well, I mean, but what do I know? I'm just some guy that's read the Bible once or twice, you know. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Uh, what is Jesus talking to himself here, or what? I don't think so. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and sitteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. Which probably pales in comparison to heaven, right, where he came from. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Huh. See, I don't know if they even believe in angels. You know, if they don't believe in the devil and fallen angels, why would they believe in good angels? I mean, you know, carry it out to its logical conclusion. I'll tell you who believes in uh, angels. The Assyrian army. There was like, uh, I think 75, I think it was 85,000 soldiers. It was over 50,000 had uh, Jerusalem surrounded. I think it was 85,000. And one angel struck them dead. Oh, yeah. One angel. Oh, okay, I was wrong. It wasn't 85,000. It was 185,000. 2 Kings chapter 19 verse 33 said by the way that he came by the same shall he return and shall not come into this city saith the Lord see they were surrounded uh, Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrian army and uh, the Lord said by the way that they came this by the same shall he return and shall not come into this city saith the Lord verse 34 for I will defend the city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. So that's a hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, 
They were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. That is a very, very large army. 185,000. That is... Oof. Now you got to realize something. Uh, Syria had taken northern Israel captive and sent, uh, take, took them away. And they took a lot of the smaller towns and cities of Judah. But God wasn't going to let them have Jerusalem. Not yet. Uh, later on, the Babylonians came. I don't remember how many years it was afterwards, but it was a number of years uh, afterward. And then the king of Babylon let them take, he let them, uh, let his army take Jerusalem captive. And then they went into Babylon. And you can read about that in the book of Daniel. And you can read about it in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations. Um, honestly, I hate, oh, I shouldn't say hate, but Lamentations and Jeremiah are just so depressing. I, I just, I, I'm not, it's not a joy to read. You know, it's not like Proverbs or Psalms, but every time I read Jeremiah, I think about uh, how we are today. Uh, you know, probably, I think uh, the most common thing that Jesus healed was people that were possessed with devils. I think that was the number one thing. Uh, we're not going to do an exhaustive study, but we'll read Matthew 8, verse 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. So, no devils. No devil theory. Uh, so, what? These people had schizophrenia and Jesus healed them of their mental illness? Uh, that's funny. Is um, Those uh, demonic spirits could speak. Let's see, how about Matthew 8? Um, let's read. All right, yeah, Matthew 8, verse 28. And when he, Jesus, was come to the other side of the, into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, Oh, but there's no devil. But yet they're talking here, saying, If thou cast, cast us out, suffer, or allow, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. Huh. So devils that don't exist can talk. Isn't that interesting? Huh. Yeah. No devil theory. Uh, sounds like uh, how to be a heretic theory, if you ask me. If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Yeah. Uh, even the pigs were smart enough to know that they didn't want to be possessed with devils. In the New Testament, Devil and devils, plural, uh, appears, according to the King James Bible online, 106 times. So for something that doesn't exist, it's sure, you know, it's over 100 times. 
Devil, the word devil or devils, plural, appears uh, over a hundred times. So how does that work? There's no devil. So how does that work? Huh. Yeah, makes you wonder, you know, where do people come up with this stuff? I honestly, I have to think that these people, maybe they exist to... Uh, what they call poisoning the well. You know, uh, any you talk to anybody that's been to Baptist church, they teach about the devil, they teach about hell, and then you tell them there's no devil, there's no hell. You think they're going to listen to anything you have to say? Absolutely not. Uh, there, you know, if you don't even understand, this is this is kindergarten Bible study stuff. Really, it is. You know, in John 8, 44, Jesus told a certain group of people, not the Romans, not the Arabs, uh, he said, ye are of your father, the devil. Ooh, well, there is no devil, Jesus. So, you know, uh, uh, you're just calling them names, right? That's what the no devil crowd believes. Uh, seriously, how do people believe this stuff? No, I think he was telling the truth. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Oh, yeah. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Jesus isn't calling them names here. He says he's telling them the truth. Ugh. Where do they come up with this no devil stuff? No hell. No devil. Soul sleep. I mean, really? Really? In Ephesians 6.11, it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Huh. Okay. Well, how about uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4? Verse 1. Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, last days, some shall depart from the faith. Ah, oh, people can depart from the faith. What does that do to the once saved, always saved, eternal security crowd? Well, some people don't believe it. They don't care what the Bible says. Hey, my pastor told me, once you believe on Jesus, that's it. Your eternal is secure. No matter what you do, doesn't matter. Um, but Jesus said we had to endure unto the end. Well, I don't care what Jesus says. My pastor says this. So, you know. Yeah. I think, I think, I think you ought to listen to Jesus and your pastor less, but... Hey, that's just my opinion. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So what are these doctrines of devils? Well, verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Ah, vegetarianism. Uh, there's a very, very famous... Uh, female and her husband 
that are Israelis, and they um, she claims that she's a vegetarian because it's the gospel of the Essenes. Um, where is the Essenes found in the Bible? Oh, they're not. Okay. They're in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, guess who's in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Israelis. You know, so what can I tell you? I wasn't allowed to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, forbidding the marriage, forbidding marriage, and uh, commanding to abstain from meats, doctrines of devils. Isn't it funny that the um, Vatican re uh, does not allow their priests to marry? Uh, I wonder if that's a coincidence there. Doctrines of devils. Huh. That's ah, just a coincidence. Right. Now, the book of James. You know, the book of James, every Christian should read this. This is like uh, Christianity 101. The book of daily living. James chapter 2, and those people will tell you, oh, well, if you believe in good works, well, then you're trying to earn your salvation. They call that lordship salvation. Well, guess what? Does a apple tree produce apples to be an apple tree? Or does an apple tree produce apples because it is an apple tree? You know what? If you are a Christian, you will have good works. And if you don't, you got a problem. I could show you some stuff that Jesus and John the Baptist said about uh, fruitless trees being hewn down and cast into the fire. James chapter 2. We're just going to skip here. Verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You see, works are a reflection of what you believe. You see some guy that's uh, crippled and, you know, it's cold. And you, you give him a coat and maybe buy him a meal. That's showing your faith. Remember the parable of the, the Good Samaritan? The Levite passed over on the other side of the road because he didn't want to be bothered with the, the man that had been almost robbed and almost murdered. But the Samaritan that was considered a Gentile, he took the guy and took care of him and paid somebody to took, look after him. That's showing your faith. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. What? The devils believe and tremble? Oh, but Chaplain Bob, the devil doesn't exist. So, you know, this is just a metaphor. Really? Verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You know, if you uh, tell people you got faith and there's no works, um... There's a verse in the Bible that says, Examine yourselves 
whether ye be in the faith. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. In 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be, vil be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, that doesn't exist, right? Oh, yeah. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, as a roaring lion, you know, Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But Satan tries to be as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Oh, yeah. Jude 1 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the who? The non existent entity? Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Huh. Revelation 2.10 Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the non-existent entity, uh, no, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Why would Jesus say that? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. What? But... Chaplain Bob, I was told just I did a 30 second sinner's prayer and I'm eternally secure. Once saved, always saved. Uh, hey, argue with Jesus. Don't argue with me. You know? And let's top this off. Maybe. Uh, we're going to read two more verses. Revelation 2.13 I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Oh, wait, there's no Satan. There's no devil. So how can he have a seat? Uh, idiots. Where do these idiots come up with these things? I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Okay. All right. Well, where? What is the ultimate faith? Uh, uh, ultimate fate. Fate. F A T E. What's the ultimate fate of where? This non-existent entity will end up. Revelation 20 and verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Oh, but chaplain Bob, hell doesn't exist either. Yeah, right. You know, I if memory serves me correctly, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. You know what? Let me look that up. Let me look that up. All right. In the entire New Testament, according to the King James Bible Online, the word hell exists 55 times in the entire Bible. In the New Testament, it exists, uh, hell is mentioned 23 times. No, oh, I was wrong. Boy, was I wrong. Boy, was I wrong. Ooh, doggy. Heaven in the King James Bible in the New Testament alone exists 277 times. Well, I was wrong. Uh, but Jesus did talk about hell. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, you could do lake of fire, but then you could say, you know, paradise. 
the kingdom, you know, so I don't know. But Jesus talked about hell. He did. It's not a metaphor. It exists. All right, let's go back to uh, Revelation 20 and verse 10 and we'll close this out. And the devil that doesn't exist. Yeah, right. Idiots. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, so here it is. There's a devil. There's a lake of fire and brimstone. The beast, the false prophet, they're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. How long is that? Uh, forever and ever. Oh, okay. Um, you know, they these deceivers either they're either they're deceivers that teach the stuff or they have no business teaching people anything. You know, they're just babies that ought to just shut their mouths and listen to people that actually know what they're, you know, talking about here that are led of the spirit. And I don't claim to be one of them. I'm just, you know, like I say, I'm just, I'm just a guy that's read the Bible a couple times. That's all. But, uh, you know, this is the kind of junk you find in uh, what they call Christian identity. And uh, there's a uh, people called Unitarians, too. They don't believe in hell. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in hell. Christ Adelphians don't believe in hell. Uh, there's a few of them. You know, it's just, uh, these people have to exist just to lead people astray. Uh, it's sad. It really is. But, you know, people don't pick up their Bible. And if they do, they, they have the wrong version. You know. I don't know. Find, find the Bible version that um, everybody hates the most. Like, you, you could go to San Francisco, uh, possibly the gay capital of the United States, and you will not find them using, you will not find them using a King James Bible. Absolutely no. Uh, they'll use an NIV. Do you know the 1984 edition of the NIV? You couldn't find two verses that absolutely proved that sodomy was a sin. I mean two verses. You know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every thing be established. Well, good luck. You couldn't find two verses. The word sodomy or uh, sodomite, the word sodomite doesn't even appear in the 84 edition of the NIV. Doesn't exist. There were no sodomites in the um, NIV. Of course, they had a sodomite on the translating committee and a lesbian. Ah. Yeah, and then uh, when she came out of the closet, uh, the NIV committee that had her on the committee, uh, they backpedaled and say, well, you know, yeah, well, she, she did work for us briefly. She goes, what do you mean briefly? I worked for you people for years working on the NIV. You know, so that's the extent of their lies. They, you know, her name was Virginia Mollencott. Matter of fact, uh, oh, I forget his name, but he was in Carolina and he uh, uh, had her on one of his shows. Uh, he was a King James uh, Pentecostal guy. Uh, except for the pre-trib rapture, I pretty much agreed with virtually everything he did. Harold Chambers. I think his name was. Uh, I was actually on his show one time. Well, I was an, a caller of one of his shows. I wasn't one of his featured guests. But, uh, yeah, he didn't like something I had to say. But he let me talk for a little bit. But then when I started bringing up the pre-trib rapture, he cut me off. That's what they do. They're always a few seconds behind so that they can cut you off, you know. 
But uh, he called Virginia Mollencott, had her on the show, didn't say anything good or bad, just asked her, oh, yeah, I heard you uh, celebrate your, uh, you know, lesbianism and, you know, let her talk. And she's like, oh, yeah, God, you know, even since I was a little girl, I knew God made me a lesbian and I, you know, I just love women. You know, God made me this way. I can't help myself. You know, and he just went on and on and on. And he didn't rebuke her. You know, he just let her talk, asked her a few questions. And, oh, yeah, tell me about your NIV thing, you know. And, and uh, boy, I'll tell you what, they didn't like it when it aired. But, uh, you know, it was her own words. And she's like, hey, um, she's like, she called the NIV people liars. She says, I got W-2s from the years that I worked for them where they paid me thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, now they want to say that I was just working for them for a brief little time. She says, I got W-2s from these people for, well, I forget, like two or three years. I don't even know if she's still alive. You're talking 20-something years ago, about 20 years ago, 20-something 20, 20 Yeah, about 20 years ago, approximately, give or take. You know, so I don't know. My suggestion is kick with stick stick with the King James. You can't go wrong. So, what can I tell you? It's the most hated Bible version there is. The Sodomites hate it. The lesbians hate it. The uh, the Jays, the you know who's hate it. Um, you know, the Vatican. Do you know that the King James is on the Vatican's do not read list? It's on their list of banned, banned books. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that tells me right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, what to read, what to, you know. All right. Well, I hope you learned something. Uh, I, it just makes me sick. The... Um, People don't read their, they don't read. They don't care. It's sad. It really is. So, what can I tell you? All right, uh, Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.